Shakespeare Toxicology Fellows. And all of the fellows are greatly excited for the March courses here. We've got some great new content coming up. So without any further ado, let's get into our Tox images. The first image is about an article entitled Blue Bottle Jellyfish Hit Australian Beaches in Gobsmacking Abundance. And these blue bottles have been found all down Tasmania's east coast, along New South Wales coast, and in parts of Victoria, and even South Australia. There's, <laughs> there's a biologist and jellyfish expert, Dr. Lisa Ann Gershwin, who said the blue bottles were at the mercy of the wind, and there's a massive armada of blue bottles along Tassie's east coast right now. The blue bottle has a blue bubble or bladder and a single fishing tentacle. A blue bottle is actually different from a true jellyfish and is made up of a complicated colony of four individuals with both male and female parts. And the blue bottle is closely related to the larger Portuguese man of war, which we're more familiar with, which is found in the Atlantic. This species found in Australia is termed the Sp Pacific man of war. The Armada is the collective noun for blue bottles, aptly named because they're usually floating out in the open ocean in huge numbers. And the Australian government's Health Direct website advises to wash the sting site with seawater and remove any tentacles, immerse the sting or run hot water on the skin for 20 minutes. And if there's no hot water, ice may also help relieve the pain. Importantly, we should not be treating this with vinegar or fresh water. The Dr. Gershwin says the way to treat this is most people just go straight for something to take care of the pain, hot water or ice. And most people don't consider that fresh water forces an immediate massive discharge of all the stinging cells that haven't fired yet. So you can take on many times more venom if you put fresh water on it first. Even if these blue bottles look like they're dead, if you put fresh water on it and rehydrate it, they can sting you very soon. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Greg Jalen, uh, one of the EMA resident rotators. Uh, today, we'll talk about a case of a Centuroides scorpion. Um, this was a 31-year-old male uh, who actually came to one of our uh, New York hospitals. He's a native of New York, but his brother was recently visiting from Mexico, and out of his brother's suitcase crawled this little critter. Um, he was stung in the foot. Uh, in the morning was initially just presenting with uh, pain at the foot, but later throughout the day had paresthesias throughout his body. Um, on arrival to the ED, uh, he was hemodynamically stable, had just subjective paresthesias, but all of his cranial nerves uh, and the rest of his neurological exam was intact. Uh, he was just observed in the ED for a few hours and then discharged after resolution of the symptoms. Uh, with some over-the-counter uh, pain treatment. Um, the Centroides scorpion is a native of Southwest America as well as Mexico, um, but these guys typically will crawl into luggage and uh, get transported anywhere, uh, commonly called stowaways. Uh, their venom does have sodium channel uh, blockage properties, and so they almost act as a neurotoxin. Um, in severe cases, you will see cranial nerve, as well as kind of systemic body uh, muscular uh, defects. Um, the main treatment is going to be uh, pain control, agitation control with benzodiazepines, and in severe cases where you have either cranial nerve or systemic skeletal muscle involvement, uh, you would use anti-venom. Thankfully, this patient did not need anti-venom and did well. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sanjay. I'm one of the second year fellows. So the Amazon canopy supports, you know, some of the richest biodiversity on the planet and also happens to be, you know, sucking up alarming levels of mercury, a recent study that was published in the New York Times. Uh, the mercury is, mercury is released into the air by miners searching for gold along nearby riverbanks. And they actually use the mercury to separate the precious metal from the surrounding sediment and then burn it off. The mercury is then carried in the air, particles catch onto leaves and dust and are washed into the forest floor by rain. 
From there, mercury appears to have transited up the food web to songbirds, which showed levels of mercury two to 12 times as high as those in comparable areas further from the mining activity. Science have long known that mercury, which is also released by burning coal, is dangerous, is a dangerous neurotoxin to both humans and animals. In aquatic ecosystems, it easily converts into something called methylmercury, which some of us may know from the infamous uh, Minimata Bay incident. In one particular region, illegal gold mining has surged in recent years, uh, along with the price of gold in global markets, and as a result, dangerously high levels of mercury have resulted. Mercury poisoning can affect the bird's ability to navigate and sing and cause harm to them by laying fewer eggs and more, and as a result, less likely to hatch as a result as well. Hi hey everyone, I'm Zach, one of the first year fellows and I have um, unfortunately going to end with a, a very sad uh, story from this month. If you're in the New York area, I'm sure that you heard and I think it was covered nationally as well, but there was a, a large fry, a large fire in a Bronx apartment building. Uh, this is a screenshot from the initial day. Um, I remember from when I was on call and uh, uh, they've revised that uh, death toll down to, to 17, but uh, uh, certainly a, a terrible uh, tragedy related to this. Um, to, to this fire, um, the uh, 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 fire itself uh, came at in this uh, affordable housing unit unit that was uh, uh, built uh, back in 1972 without a sprinkler system um, as was legal. Um, ultimately, a space heater was uh, implicated, um, and the fire itself barely spread beyond one unit. But there was a, a door that was left open. Smoke essentially went um, <clears throat> uh, up a. Um, uh, a, a stairwell here, um, and then uh, on the 15th floor, which ended up being the most dangerous spot, a door was left open, and all the, the smoke um, was uh, was out there. Um, uh, they said a, a lot of people, because it wasn't uh, the fire itself, and we're just trying to leave and get to that stairwell, um, ultimately uh, would have been uh, safer had they been able to just stay in their units. Um, uh, so nationally, the use of space heaters has been uh, linked to a number of fi fires and. Um, about uh, 80 deaths a year um, that come from them. And unfortunately, this is a, an asymmetric uh, issue in our society, and uh, especially in New York City. Um, Low-income neighborhoods in the Bronx and Brooklyn and uh, northern Manhattan, um, communities that are historically uh, home to, um, the, to people of color have a higher percentage of um, residents that, residences that rely on these uh, space heaters and are at higher risk. Um, so, so like the smoke was implicated in all these deaths, um, and uh, smoke uh, from a toxin perspective is a complex um, system that has uh, a simple asphyxiant such as carbon dioxide, irritant gases that cause inflammation and edema, um, and chemical uh, asphyxiants such as cyanide and carbon dioxide, and all of them combined in this uh, in this particular situation. With that, I'm going to stop and I'll hand it over to uh, Dr. Bloom to go over our first uh, case of the day. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Josh Bloom. I'm one of the first year toxicology fellows here at New York City Poison Control. The first case of the day is what I'm going to call reliable methods. Here's our standard opening slide. So this is a case of a 22 year old woman with a past medical history of fibromyalgia, major depression and ADHD. She came to an emergency department with a chief complaint of shortness of breath. She admitted to taking an overdose of a substance she ordered online after getting information on reliable suicide methods from an internet forum. I wanna actually pause right here because I'm curious if people in the audience have an idea or you know, a good grasp on what kind of things our patients or people in our communities might find if they did that kind of search on the internet. You're asking that as a question, Josh, for somebody? Mm -hmm. It's a question to the audience. And Suzanne Doyen could probably help you. One second, I'm going to pull Suzanne up. Suzanne. 
Go ahead, Suzanne. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm not sure what you get when you do this search and I probably should conduct the search myself, but I do know that a number of people have ended up uh, taking um, the fertilizers, the sodium nitrite, the nitrates. Uh, recently, it's been described at our poison center in Connecticut, but also at poison centers throughout the country. And it would give short this kind of shortness of breath presentation that he, she has. So, and it's a successful way of, of committing suicide. So I'm thinking sodium nitrite, but I really don't know what happens if you put reliable suicidal methods. In the old days, we had the the book Final Exit that recommended, uh, which was a European book that recommended uh, chloroquine and quinine and anti-malarials. Uh, we also had. Uh, a final exit here, uh, like book in the United States that recommended barbiturates and and putting a bag over your head. So many, many different ways of of committing suicide have been recommended in the past. But I'm a little bit concerned here about um, methemoglobinemia and sodium nitrate. You may have to help, Josh. So you got a lot of good answers there. No, actually, that's very helpful, and I really appreciate that. Um, and so we'll move on to the you know initial triage vitals for this patient. Uh, and you can see that the patient has some tachycardia and tachypnea and, you know, mimicking the concern that uh, Suzanne expressed, uh, this patient does have a low O2 saturation. Her O2 saturation does improve to 92% on 15 liters per minute of oxygen by non rebreather. This is her examination in the ED. Um, generally unremarkable, except for the tachycardia and tachypnea you saw from the vitals. The team did note that the patient had diffuse pallor and specifically said the patient did not have cyanosis by their judgment. This is the initial set of diagnostics that were done on the patient, and you can see a lot of these tests are normal. They did take a blood gas, which showed an elevated blood lactate, but the pH was normal. Initial chest X-ray was clear. Liver function tests were normal. And the patient's co-ingestin panel was also negative. I know that Suzanne mentioned nitrites uh, as a frequent method that people might find if they search for reliable suicide methods. Uh, and I'm curious if there are any other substances that people might have in mind that could cause a presentation like this. Okay, we have maybe Rich Hamilton can help us. Good, Rich. Yeah, I think no, Suzanne is spot on. Um, I, I just think in the COVID era I, uh, of chlorine dioxide is another possibility in a uh, patient with methemoglobinemia like this. Does the patient have methemoglobinemia? Oh, <laughs> I've suspected of methemoglobinemia. Okay, so how would you sort this out since that's uh, it's a good suggestion in your part? Well, we're, we're waiting for the uh, for the spectro uh, photochemistry uh, results. Okay, any other thoughts? So, why don't you move forward, Josh? Yeah, so I think that, I think that, you know, most of, most of our audience probably saw this right away and expected the methemoglobin to be elevated. And as we expected, it was. Uh, so the methemoglobin in this patient was over 30%, which was beyond the uh, upper limit of measurement for this uh, emergency department's assay. And they unfortunately had to do a repeat VBG with coaximetry because their base VBG did not include coaximetry. And so that's why the initial set of labs didn't have this measurement. So just a brief review, although I'm sure we're all very familiar, uh, you know, substances like sodium nitrate and other and various other things that are strong oxidizers can convert ferrous iron to ferric iron, uh, which can, you know, produce methemoglobin and methemoglobin does not have uh, as good of an oxygen carrying capacity and that can, you know, result in this relative hypoxia uh, that, that we see in our patients. Uh, in terms of restoring the normal hemoglobin, uh, various reductases are involved in the regeneration of ferrous, uh, of ferrous iron. Um, the antidote that we use, methylene blue, is specifically reduced by uh, an ADPH methemoglobin reductase into leukomethylene blue. And that compound is then able to oxidize to allow the reduction of methemoglobin. So the differential diagnosis for methemoglobin is, you know, m many substances can cause this. And, you know, I think people have already brought up, you know, nitrites and nitrates, which are common sources. Generally, nitrogen-containing and sulfur-containing compounds can also be oxidative 
you know, and cause this effect. Uh, some other compounds that, uh, that, that we see here that cause us concern are things like naphthalene, uh, you know, trinitrotoluene. Uh, some medications that are heavily implicated include things like uh, dapsone. So this patient had taken sodium nitrite, and this is actually the bottle that she had ordered from a website called laballey.com. Uh, she measured out 25 grams of sodium nitrite based on the internet search that she'd done, uh, which told her that that would be a reliable method for killing herself. Um, and she and she ingested that prior, you know, shortly prior to coming to the emergency department. Uh, one thing of note, uh, she had actually planned this in advance, obviously, because she she ordered the substance online, but she had changed her mind and canceled the order. Unfortunately, laballey.com still sent her the substance and she decided in, in the end to go through with her suicide attempt. So this is the website the patient used to look up reliable suicide methods. It's a website called Quora, uh, which is a general question and answer website, not specific to suicide. Threads are generated by users and grouped into categories. Anyone with an email address can register for this website for free and no identity confirmation is required. I actually registered for this website to see if I could find out uh, the kind of the kind of uh, threads that this patient was reading. So this is one of the first posts that comes up if you look under the suicide topic. Uh, and I blanked out this person's name, uh, but this person identifies as an advocate for the right to assisted suicide in euthanasia. I'll give you all a second to read this. I found it to be a little disturbing. What you might note is that this person recommends two specific substances that a general person should be able to obtain to kill themselves. They describe specific recommended doses and the dose of sodium nitrite is the dose used by our patient. They also describe ways to bypass controls that might prevent people from getting these substances. And finally, this person also describes how the death is expected to feel, uh, which is which is a topic that seems to be frequently discussed in these types of threats. So on the same page as the initial thread, uh, every thread on Quora has a connection to similar threads and all of these uh, statements or links, so you can click on each one of them to go to a separate thread where someone asked that question. And you can see that, you know, many threads exist on this website where people were asking similar kinds of questions. How could they effectively kill themselves in a painless way that would be certain to work? So this, this trend is something that's been observed, you know, by people in our, in our toxicology community. And this is a publication by a future fellow here, uh, Kyle Pyers, uh, where they looked at uh, the national poison data system, specifically over, over, you know, over the past three years, uh, from 2018 to 2020, they did notice an increase in major outcomes and death outcomes related to ingestion of nitrites. So this is another study uh, that was done by Sean McCann and colleagues, and uh, and they looked at a similar data set, but uh, you know over 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 a longer period of time, and they noted a thirty percent mortality in the NPDES data for nitrite exposures uh, over the past five years. So this is a case series from Craig Smolin and their group in uh, California. The reason I brought this one up is because they documented a patient who took an extremely large dose of sodium nitrite, 60 grams, which is the highest dose that I could find when I was researching this subject. That patient actually survived after extremely aggressive therapy. They gave the patient high dose methylene blue as well as a, as well as a blood transfusion. I have not seen uh, any other ingestion this high that led to survival. And I know Suzanne brought up uh, her experiences with this, but I'm curious if anyone else in the audience has been experiencing an uptick in these types of ingestions uh, or has any experiences they'd like to describe. We could ask uh, Judith Arenheim. She knows anything about this. I'm not sure she's here, Dr. Goldfrank. I thought it said JC. I thought that was she, but maybe not. Maybe. Um, 
Well, well, if there's no one answering right away, C. Hirschman, could you tell us um, whether you were surprised that uh, 15 liters of nasal O2 changed the pulse ox in this person from 83 to 92? I was. Some, someone else may answer if he's not there. V? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, okay. I, I think it, it is quite surprising that 15 liters is needed. If, if you have a non rebreathing mask, you really don't need much more than a couple of liters just to keep the bag filled uh, as a reservoir. You don't need to go that high. And the fact that it went from 80 something to 92, uh, it's a bit surprising that you, you topped off above 87 with methemoglobinemia. But uh, generally speaking, I don't think it's a uh, it, it's it's a big surprise. You'll get some change. And I don't know what kind of uh, uh, device they were using, but I would say it's a little on the low side. Rich Hamilton, what do you think about that or not? Did it surprise you? Thanks, Fee. A bit, you know. Usually, if you look at the um, the absorption curves, the infrared red uh, absorption curves on a on a cooximeter or a pulse oximeter. Um, uh, the algorithm seems to always uh, calculate the saturation to the 80s, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, high 80s to low 80s. So, even when the patient has even a, a, a very high methemoglobin level, the, uh, the pulse ox will still read in the 80s. And then a low methemoglobin level, it'll, it'll be, you know, in the same, like this 30% in the same range. So. Um, you know, maybe the patient was actually um, uh, improving on some level or, um, you know, had some uh, hypoxia, which was, you know, resolving uh, with the oxygen. But um, other than that, it usually just the way the algorithm works, it just usually always ends up in the in that mid to high 80s. Did you all discuss that, Josh? Who was you? Yeah, so when when this ca when this case came up, we did discuss the uh, the O2 the O2 response that they saw in their pulse oximeter, and I and I think we concluded that you know given that there's a variety of different uh, of different pulse oximeters on the market that might use different algorithms, it is possible to envision uh, an algorithm re you know re resulting in this 92% result on on oxygen. It's also possible that the oxygen reported by the team was a transient. Reading, you know, which I've seen people do on a busy resuscitation when they're just looking at the monitor. Okay, was there? Any, I don't know if there anybody in the chat wanted to respond to your prior question or not, Mark. I'm sorry. What was the prior question? It, Josh's question was looking with other people had experiences like this with sodium nitrite or other. Uh, notes off the off the internet to how to one commit suicide yeah we've seen these cases here i mean josh had this case and i believe maybe last year or so morgan riggan had also presented a case that she encountered and maybe awesome too i think may have had another case so i think these cases uh seem to be increasing in prevalence of the sodium nitrate specifically okay a anything else you want to tell us josh yeah, so this so this is this is not this is not an issue, you know, uh, localized to our region. The New York Times actually did an expose on this issue uh, in December, uh, and they were specifically looking at suicide directed websites. So these are websites that are themed around suicide and specifically for people seeking ways to commit suicide or advice about how to commit suicide. Um, and various types of these websites exist on the internet and they are intermittently shut down and then restarted in different places. Um, you know, one, one of the interesting points of data that they bring is that, you know, from the particular website that they were looking at, uh, there were 53 discussion posts about suicide methods and 28 posts that actually narrated suicide attempts where people would say, I've taken this to kill myself and then they, you know, no longer logged on again. Uh, the New York Times investigation was also able to reveal multiple people who logged onto these websites, left a goodbye message after receiving advice, and subsequently killed themselves. And the post on the right is one of those examples. Uh, this is actually a post from a 16-year-old uh, who thanked people for their good wishes and their help uh, in assisting him 
move towards committing suicide. And you can see that many people responded uh, to his final message as well, wishing him luck and asking him to document his experiences if possible. So lawmakers have been trying to uh, oppose the generation and, and you know, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, presence of these websites uh, on the internet. And there's been a few avenues suggested to address these legally. However, it's a pretty complicated issue. There are multiple jurisdictions involved. There's issues that you know one might be concerned with regulation of speech, and you know, and how to enforce any regulations about these websites, you know, is also a challenge because when you shut one down, another one can just be started. Um, and also, there's a question, you know, pertaining to our patient on how to enforce these types of things on general social media websites that aren't devoted to suicide. And you know, is this something that is left to the to the private to the private corporations that manage these websites, or is it something that the government has the ability to step in on? And so this is this is fairly controversial and a challenging subject. So in this case, uh, fortunately, there was a good outcome, and so this patient received two mg per kilogram of methylene blue, with symptomatic improvement. Her meth her repeat met hemoglobin level was one percent. Um, and she was monitored in the ICU for 24 hours uh, and transitioned to general medicine. Uh, she, she, so this, 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 sorry, I didn't update this presentation from last month. At that time, she was still waiting for inpatient psychiatric admission, but she's actually uh, made it to, to inpatient psychiatric admission. A bed took a little while to open up. So I do have a follow up case of sorts because we received two of these calls within the same week. So we have a case number two actually attached to this subject, and this was an unknown middle-aged male who was found pulseless and blue in a park next to empty bottles of sodium nitrite. EMS intubated him and they initiated CPR, and uh, poison control was actually contacted while CPR was in process in the emergency department. The patient was uh, at 50% on 100% FiO2 and had active CPR going, and the team had already given two milligrams per kilogram of methylene blue. The team asked us, you know, is there any further measure that can be considered for a person like this? And so that's something I actually am curious if uh, if the audience has any has any input. Okay. Any of the people who made comments earlier, uh, Svi or uh, Richard, do you want to finish the discussion? Well, I, you know, a second dose is something to consider. Uh, um, unfortunately, maybe this patient also has a G6PD deficiency, uh, which uh, we have to think about um, before we would consider a second dose. And there's um, a little bit of data on the use of vitamin C uh, in patients uh, with methemoglobinemia that uh, might also provide another route of treatment. Ultimately, if, if it's G6PD deficient patient, you're potentially looking at exchange transfusions or something like that. Okay, great. Anything else? Anybody wants to say? Want to carry on, Josh? All right. So yeah, we have, so we actually looked into this issue as well. Although I could tell you that this patient with active CPR in progress obviously carried a poor prognosis to begin with. Um, so you know there have been multiple cases where. You know, hyperbaric oxygen has been pursued uh, for patients with severe methemoglobinemia. I mean, this was a particular case from a South Korean group where a patient developed methemoglobinemia after exposure to nitrites in car exhaust. Uh, so, at this, in this hospital, methylene blue was unavailable, but they did have a hyperbaric chamber, and they gave the patient serial doses of hyperbaric oxygen at two atmospheres. They tracked their patient's methemoglobin levels, and the patient ultimately survived with a good outcome. Interestingly, there's a theoretical you know, assumption that a three atmosphere dive in hyperbaric oxygen should be able to sustain tissue oxygenation even in the absence of hemoglobin. So even if someone had profound methemoglobinemia related to an overdose, it is possible that a three atmosphere dive could sustain them from an oxygenation perspective. So, and uh, I believe we've also mentioned the exchange transfusion. So this is a case series from an Indian group that reviewed the use of a whole blood exchange transfusion as a therapy for severe methemoglobinemia. And there were various reasons why they pursued these therapies, including uh, failure of methylene blue therapy or hemolysis uh, in, you know, in reaction to, to a methylene blue administration. 
they did exchanges of you know two to three you know two to, two to three or even four you know four point nine liters, uh, and uh, these patients all actually had good outcomes. This is a case from a Danish group which had a patient uh, with <laughs> methemia from isobutyl nitrite, and uh, this patient was refractory to standard therapies. So they gave this patient a combination of hyperbaric therapy as well as a three liter exchange transfusion for 4.5 liters of blood, of blood products. And that patient also had a good outcome. Finally, I saw a recent case report uh, from a Taiwanese group where they had a patient with severe met hemoglobinemia and cardiac arrest uh, from unintentional ingestion of sodium nitrites. So that's kind of similar to our patient, except their case was unintentional. Um, methylene blue was delayed in this hospital, but they were able to cannulate the patient for ECMO. Um, and using ECMO, they were able to stabilize the patient until they could deliver antidote. Uh, this patient survived without deficits. Unfortunately, in the case of our patient, in case number two, uh, you know, they did attempt full resuscitative measures. He was deemed too unstable for these kinds of, these kinds of uh, heroic measures, and so he expired. Some take home points from this presentation, uh, you know, information on deadly methods of suicide by poisoning is freely available on the internet. And, you know, these things seem to follow trends as, as Suzanne alluded to before. So we should try to keep our ears open for what the current trend is and, you know, be aware because sodium nitride is easily obtained, for example, by determined individuals, can result in catastrophic methemoglobinemia that needs to be treated quickly. In cases of refractory methemoglobinemia, we should always remember that there are, you know, Ex extraordinary measures that can be attempted, such as hyperbaric oxygen therapies or exchange transfusion. And uh, that's my presentation. Thank you very much. By the way, going to what Susan mentioned before, I performed that search uh, myself. And when you search for suicide on Google, this is the result you get. Uh, thankfully, Google at least has initiated a kind of you know search engine diversion strategy where if you search for suicide methods, the first thing they produce is a Prominently, you know, prominently featured banner that sh that leads you to the National Suicide Prevention Hot Lifeline. Josh, we have a question from Z. Um, he's asking about: Is there any information on non-blood O2 carriers for methemoglobinemia? I I didn't I didn't uh, do a lot of reading on that. Uh, the only thing I found in terms of non-blood O2 carriage is, is, is in regards to hyperbaric oxygen, in which case, you know, your blood can be made of normal saline or, 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 another, or another liquid, and you should still presumably have oxygenation. Um, but I, I am curious to learn about these, uh, these alternative blood carriers. Mark, I seem to remember. Oh, go ahead. This is Suzanne. I have a couple of questions um, about this case and just in general. So the second case you presented, the patient received just two milligrams of methylene blue and no more. Am I correct? I received two milligrams of methylene blue. There was concern from the team that the patient had been had a prolonged downtime. And so the efforts were actually not continued for very long after poison control was consulted. Okay. Uh, and, and so uh, the two comments I wanted to make is. You know, I divide the methylene blue patients into two groups, basically the intentional suicide patients, which again, my poison center has had a couple of, of uh, uh, cases of those. And I, I think we need to be very aggressive with our methylene blue dosing in those patients versus either the people that are abusing, uh, uh, you know, the, the nitrites or, or the amyl nitrite or the people that are have an adverse drug reaction from Dapsone or something of that, which probably will get better. Uh, they're usually less severe, but will get better with slightly smaller doses of methylene blue. So I think I would have pushed the methylene blue dose in that particular patient. And also, and I believe we need to warn people about this, I, I, after you administer, immediately after you administer methylene blue, the pulse ox goes down on the patient a little bit. Uh, and, and you have to reassure the treating physicians to stay the course. It probably just has to do with the fact that it's blue and it's just interfering with the oximeter. But I, just FYI, a, a word if you're ever on the phone with a, a, an emergency physician who is administering uh, methylene blue, that's all. Okay, great, Suzanne. Anything else anybody thinks wants to add? Josh, who, is, who tried to help you on this case? So uh, I believe, I believe uh, Bob Hoffman was with me uh, on the second case, and I think uh, it might have been Mark Sue with case number one with the patient who survived. Bob, do you want to say anything else about this? 
Yeah, I would love to just make two quick comments. First of all, everybody learned that the pulse ox gravitates towards 80 whatever. Um, these are two nice examples demonstrating that that's not really perfectly true. All of that literature came from ear oximetry in dogs. And as I always remind people, dog hemoglobin isn't people hemoglobin. Otherwise, we would have a cocker spaniel farm instead of a blood shortage. So, you know, everybody who's done enough of these have seen people with profound met hemoglobins that aren't very impressive in the 80s and often very much in the 70s or lower that seem to come up a little bit with supplemental oxygen for whatever reason. The pulse ox is a strange bird. And the other part of this is I think this G6PD deficiency concern in people with met hemoglobin is largely overplayed because it's based almost exclusively on a single case report by Peter Rosen with a unique ingestion, which was aniline, which depletes NADPH by virtue of its metabolism. Ernie Butler, uh, really one of the godfathers of hematology, now dead for some time, demonstrated quite nicely that in G6PD deficient blood, methylene blue works. And the reason it works is because there's always a young population of cells that are replete in NADPH that convert the leukomethylene blue, which then diffuses out and helps the other cells deal with their reduction reactions. So you know, if somebody was dying, I can't imagine a concern, a case where I would ever withhold methylene blue for concern of G6PD deficiency. Uh, it, 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 you know, you can always pick up the pieces later and give them blood if they hemolyze. Okay, great. So let's, we've done a good job, Josh, and let's see who's going to replace you at the podium there. Another. Right. Let's, uh, we'll, we'll move on to the next presentation. Thanks, Bruce. Right. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am another Josh in the uh, in the fellowship of Josh Trebach, one of the second year talks fellows. It's good to be here, and I am happy to chat about this case that I had, which I've entitled "Transfer Troubles." So this case is a uh, thirteen-year-old female. She's got a past medical history of anemia. Presented to the emergency department about four hours after an overdose of pills in an attempt to manage her dysmenorrhea. Uh, the reason I framed it like this is because the patient was denying any sort of suicidality or suicide attempt, uh, but through the team's history taking and uh, a question asking, they became a little bit concerned uh, just by the, the way the patient was acting that there may have been some some alternative motives behind the um, uh, overdose of pills. It was good history taking on their part. The initial vital signs are as you see here. And the patient's physical exam was notable for a uh, patient with some diffuse discomfort in the abdomen, no peritonitis, no focality to the pain, and just in general was vomiting. The team obtained some blood work, which I'll put here, notably, um, I'll let you interpret them. No hints, no hints from me. <laughs> and, and yeah, so that was actually the initial story we, we had, uh, just that medical history of, of anemia and, and taking a lot of pills for their, their menstrual pain. Uh, so I can pause here to see if this rings any, any bells or makes people think of certain, certain things before I, I go ahead and tell you what we, what we, what we elucidated by her further history taking. Okay, Kevin, Kevin Osterhout. Kevin, are you there? Yep, just takes me a minute to get through the mute process. Hi, everybody. Nice case, Josh. Um, you've got me stumped so far, right? Uh, I think the most commonly prescribed medicine for dysmenorrhea would be an NSAID. Um, I guess along with that, I would think about salicylates. It could cause lots of medical problems. Um, 
Obviously, some people that are having ongoing pain will get prescribed hormonal therapy, and I would think that a teenager could kind of assume that taking a whole month's worth of hormonal therapy would be beneficial. Um, and I don't know where to go from there. The laboratory studies weren't too impressive to me. The BUN looked a little bit high, but the bicarb was okay. Um, and then you mentioned that she's anemic, which brings in um, iron as well. But... Okay, great. What do you think, Heather Long, help us early on in the case? Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I think that I agree with most of what Kevin said. So I think of like my doll and I know there's various um, preparations, some containing, um, as Kevin said, uh, salicylate, some containing caffeine, um, as well as the NSAIDs, the anemia um, <laughs> makes iron a concern and we might see um, a delay in ab vital sign abnormalities, um, whereas if this was a significant salicylate uh, poisoning, you'd expect to see some vital sign abnormalities at this point. Okay, great. So, Josh? Yeah, so the team said, hmm, exactly like uh, my colleagues here have said, the team said, hmm, what, well, you have this medical history of anemia, what are you on? Uh, they were able to figure out that she did take iron, and this was part of what she took in an attempt to manage her, her menstrual menstrual pain, but then also took uh, a large amount, unclear exactly, of, of pamperin, and this was a special formulation of pamperin that is for menstrual cramps and specifically contained aspirin, uh, acetaminophen, and caffeine. Uh, after obtaining all of this information, the team chatted a little bit more with the patient and, and the history was uh, elicited that this was a suicide attempt. So uh, following suit, some, some concentrations were obtained. Uh, and for those who think I may have made an error with my units, mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 I promise you this is what was verbatim told to me and read off the, uh, <laughs> it was one of those conversations where they're like, oh, it's the iron was 508, micrograms per ml and I was like you mean deciliter correct and they were like no it says ml and I was like can you read it to me and they were like ml and so I was like mm, okay that's fair uh so uh, I think this may have just been a way that this this hospital reported that because we usually think about iron in terms of micrograms per deciliter and 508 micrograms per milliliter would be like 50,000 uh, micrograms per deciliter which would be which would be quite a lot so uh, we were able later to clarify that the uh, the concentration was 508 uh, micrograms per deciliter, but this is what was initially reported to me, and I was like, hmm. Uh, we also have an acetaminophen concentration of about 75, and then an aspirin of 34. And again, this was uh, about four hours afterwards. So, uh, going from here, the patient got some IV fluids, antiemetics, supportive care, they had an abdominal X-ray that showed some. Uh, three small radio opaque densities. I apologize, I wasn't able to get the the uh, picture of the the x-ray for us, us today. The patient continued to have persistent uh, GI symptoms, abdominal pain, then started continuing vomiting, and then had a drop in the blood pressure down to 90 over 60. Uh, the, the team was actually, it was a very busy day in the emergency department. There was a lot of things going back. We were calling each other back uh, very frequently. And so then they called back and said, hey, like, what are we supposed to do with this aspirin? And what are we supposed to do with this iron? They said, from a nomogram perspective of the acetaminophen, We've kind of, we feel comfortable with that, but just to refresh, so the aspirin was 34. Un, we don't know. Uh, all I know is that this was in in pamperin, and then the iron was was 508. And so they called and said, uh, "What do we do next?" So uh, I can I can I can open the floor. I can share with with y'all what I said. You can you can share what you said. Sure sure sure. So. Uh, I, as I began to explain my, my concerns, they immediately interrupted me and said, actually, we need to transfer this patient because we can't handle this. We're a tiny uh, uh, ER. We can't admit patients here. We need to transfer. We need some help. And so then the question became not what does this patient need, but what do they need before being transferred? So it was a very interesting uh, situation uh, for me to be in. So from an, from an aspirin standpoint, you know, I talked with my uh, attending who had worked with me on this case. And given the patient's persistent symptoms, we weren't clear if this aspirin concentration was was going up, was going down, and unfortunately, the 
the rate at which labs were able to be drawn at this hospital was taking several, several hours. So we weren't going to be able to reliably count on rechecks. Uh, I did make the decision from an aspirin standpoint to hold on initiation of bicarbonate therapy simply because the patient's initial potassium on arrival was 3.0. And then with persistent, persistent vomiting hadn't been rechecked yet, and they were unable to get her emesis under control. So I was worried about starting urinary alkalinization in the context of hypokalemia. So uh, I held off on that and instead encouraged them to replete her electrolytes uh, and, and recheck a, a blood gas as soon as she got to the to the new hospital. Their blood gas machine was also not functioning properly at this hospital, so getting a rapid check of her lights was not really feasible, uh, unfortunately. And you know, I talked with them about the some of the pitfalls of trying to do urinary alkalinization of a patient's hypokalemic, and and as we all all know, uh, it's really important to pay attention to your potassium if you're initiating this therapy. From a iron overdose standpoint, I was actually a little bit worried that this patient had taken enough to have these GI symptoms in addition to worsening emesis and has now gotten uh, to be uh, a little bit low blood pressure. I The question came up as to whether or not we should initiate deferoxamine therapy in the middle of transport or like give it to EMS and have them start it. Uh, I made the judgment call to, to hold off on doing that as I would prefer the patient to be intravascularly, uh, you know, uh, hydrated and continue to provide supportive care simply because I don't really know if that's a. I do know that that is not a common med EMS frequently gives mid transport and I don't think that was the safest thing to do for the patient before they're optimized uh, while being transferred to a different center. So I discussed with the team sort of the risk benefit and that my personal thought would be to hold off on initiating deferoxamine therapy at this time. Talked about some of the things that we can see with deferoxamine like hypotension. Uh, and then, you know, some delayed things that we can see later on or ARDS. And then the last point here is a, a fun boards pearl. But regardless, the team who was seeing the patient in the ED was agreeable with that. They said, okay, we're going to replete her electrolytes. We're going to get her fluids, uh, give her some fluids, get her emesis under control. And then she arrived at a, the next hospital's PICU. And immediately when she hit the door there, the PICU sort of, even before talking with us, uh, started deferoxamine started sodium bicarbonate therapy, and then rechecked everything. They were able to confirm that her, her initial iron was, I don't know if they had the original blood or how they were able to do this. They were able to confirm that the initial iron was uh, 508 uh, micrograms per ml. And then when they rechecked it, uh, it had come down, uh, after starting deferoxamine therapy, it had come down to the low 100s. And then after uh, around six hours of deferoxamine therapy had come down to like uh, the 50s or 60s. And the patient was doing a lot better. So uh, it, it was a, it was the first time I've ever encountered this uh, when a patient's being transferred. And I don't think the question of how do you initiate the management of a vomiting hypotensive iron overdose as you're putting them in EMS that was a very very unique situation for me. So I thought that was a good uh, way to exercise some some toxicology muscles. But ultimately, the patient did well, and uh, this was. Uh, the case. So I'm not sure if anyone has any questions or comments, but uh, happy ending. The patient ended up going to psychiatry and then doing well. Well, you could we could use uh, Kathleen Clancy to tell us what she thinks about transferring people treatment under these circumstances and what the actual results mean. Can you hear me? Can you hear yes. Me? Can you hear me? Yes. Um. So transferring someone on a medication is always difficult. And I feel like you need to balance it with the uptake of the drug. So you have to think about how long your transport time is, what is the possible downside. I, I don't remember what this person's baseline blood pressure is. I, I personally think I would have started the deferoxamine in transport, but I, I don't know how long the transport time is. I just would worry that you know, her little liver cells are taking up the iron as she's driving along and then she's going to get to the PICU and it sounds like your PICU is really on top of it, but maybe there was no PICU bed and she's going to end up stopping in the ER. And so I would worry about delayed. Maybe it's just a DC thing, but our mm -hmm. transports are awful. We had, we it takes forever for people to be moved and for the ambulance to get there and then for people to get situated in their new place. So I personally would have started the deferoxamine um, and assumed that EMS could 
give her fluids if needed. Okay, we can go back to Kevin since he's started the case. Kevin still there? Yeah. Hi there. Yeah, I think we, you know, we we take incoming transports like this a lot at our hospital and um i think that some quick intravenous normal saline to restore intravascular volume would be fine and i would have had no problem recommending defroxamine um, with a level that we believe is over 500 maybe higher with some wacky units with lots of vomiting with radio opacities on the um on the x-ray, but it kind of depends on how long you think it will actually take for the transport to occur. If you really think that that was an honest one to two hour, then getting them to a place where they're gonna get good care sounds like a great idea. Sometimes I find my transports coming in that are supposed to be one or two hours, nine hours later are still out there in the world and and I get concerned about them. And especially with iron because it, it kind of goes into tissues and comes out of the bloodstream relatively quickly. But uh, overall, I thought the, the care was excellent. Thanks, Josh. So, Silas, what do you think about transporting and uh, antidote use? Which ones might be better to use and which ones not? Yeah. Uh, I think we may have a little bit of reverberation. It also depends on what the EMS unit can handle. Is this a critical care EMS unit or is it just uh, a paramedic unit, uh, given the number of antidotes that are being potentially started uh, both for alkalinization as well as the deferoxamine, uh, it also becomes uh, what cognitive load can maybe only one person in the, in the back handle. Uh, and so that's probably best decided in, in conjunction with the, the primary hospital, which still retains responsibility for a safe transfer of that patient um, to the receiving site, the individual paramedic or critical care unit, depending on what capabilities it has, uh, as well as what the patient looks like uh, in, in transport. Uh, we've had cases where critical antidotes such as high dose insulin, euglycemia, uh, supporting patients with terrible cardiovascular toxicity have actually run out in transport uh and uh, led to patient um, adverse outcomes so I, I think it's weighing all of that and, and making sure that whomever's doing the transport will also be able to sustain the uh the antidotal therapy um during the whole transport because uh, we've had cases where that's run out i don't think there's a single decision great and what do you think about this uh you think this this woman was uh, this child was uh, iron toxic? What does it mean, these results? A question for me, Dr. Well, either of you, yep, yeah, you can handle yeah. it. Dr. Goldfrank, th this is Suzanne Doyon speaking, and I, I want to relate a, an experience from a randomized controlled trial that I performed many, many, many years ago. Uh, where we asked healthy human volunteers to ingest a certain amount of iron. It was usually 20 per kilo. And we measured, you know, this was done in a uh, facility where you could measure the iron uh, over time. And uh, many of them, especially the women, uh, developed serum concentrations of iron above 500 at that dose, 550, um, and did develop a bit of GI distress, so to speak, uh, but came back down right away. I'm not too frazzled by an iron concentration above 500, 508 like this one. And I want to remind everybody, there's pamperin involved here. Pamperin has caffeine. Caffeine can cause hypokalemia, nausea, vomiting, hypotension. There's hardly a pamperin overdose out there that is not vomiting. Um, so I would have not given deferoxamine. I would have given fluids, antiemetics, and monitored these concentrations over time and um, decided, uh, uh, you know, accordingly. But uh, different people, different ways of doing things. Okay, that's great. So, Josh, did you listen to Susan or whom did you listen to? <laughs> uh, wait, did, or did you ask who, who I listened to? Yeah, tell what happened. Yeah, what? so this was this, I will say this was a, uh, this is a, I'm a, I'm a second year fellow now, Dr. Goldfrank. So I, I, I uh, listen to my heart and uh, I, I, I agree with Dr. Doyon that I was, although this patient had a, an iron concentration of, of 508, 
Uh, and I felt a little bit more comfortable given the rest of the things that they took. Uh, I made the decision based off the fact that the transport time, I knew they were going to be going to a PICU. I knew it wasn't going to take like four or five, six hours. I think it only took, uh, I think it took less than two hours, I believe, um, maybe faster than that. Uh, and uh, I, I spun this together as uh, could be iron toxic, could be caffeine toxic, but either way, I think the risk benefit was in favor of good supportive care opposed to initiation of antidotal therapy uh, prior going to, to EMS. So uh, as, as the, if I was to put my money down and say whether this person was iron toxic, I'd say uh, the, the iron and caffeine probably worked in conjunction to paint this clinical picture. I don't think it was exclusively the iron that caused this patient's symptoms. Okay. That's and what I got. It did pretty great. Yes, you did. And ended well for this young woman. So yeah, she did well. She she um <laughs> I don't mean I did pretty great. The patient did great. Uh she uh was in the ICU, she got cleared from the ICU, went to psychiatry, uh, and was and made a and made a full recovery. So it was it was a happy ending for everyone. Okay. So, but it was suicide attempt or yeah. it was just it was so the what was uh the end result was that the patient did endorse that this was a suicide attempt while she was in the original emergency department after the initial history about the uh, pamperin and iron was taken. They did some more questioning and more some some more questions and found out that there was some more. The reason that she took this wasn't in fact because of a suicide attempt, but uh, I don't know how long her inpatient psychiatric stay was, but I do know that she was able to receive that therapy and when I um, uh, was calling to check on her. She was from a medical perspective. Uh, she didn't. She had a resolution of all of her, her medical concerns, but was being psychiatrically tended to. Okay, great. So let's thanks a lot, Josh. Yeah, thank you very much. Great. Uh, pull up my colleague's presentation here. All right. Everyone ignore what you just saw. All right, cool. <laughs> All right, we'll take a step back after Josh started my presentation a little early there. But um, so I'm going to talk to you all today um, about a uh, an, an interesting case um, involving a um, a a 29 year old uh, female. Um, so <clears throat> there's a this case started off with a 29 year old uh, woman going to uh, uh, urgent care. So she had no past medical history. Uh, she just had noticed that she had had some right leg swelling um, over the past uh, 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 two days and noticed that it was starting to become quite painful um, and was really limiting her mobility. Um, at the urgent care, they were they were worried about how it looked and uh, sent her over to the emergency department. So in the emergency department, uh, she had uh, nor uh, normal vital signs, uh, but uh, a number of uh, strange findings on physical exams. So she had um, some. Uh, these are uh, pictures from her chart, actually. So she has some picture, some uh, some fatigue lesions throughout her mouth. She had bruising, um, kind of throughout her body in different areas, and her right leg was significantly more swollen um, than her left leg. Um, they also noticed that it was pretty. Uh, pretty tight. Um, she had had no uh, history of a bleeding disorder. She no, no bleeding disorders ran in the family. There was no history of any sort of ingestion. All of this was kind of spontaneous. Um, in the emergency department, um, she they started uh, they started with a workup uh, within normal limits or close to normal limits uh, was her CBC, um, although it's, um, slightly um, anemic. But her chemistry, her LFTs, um, lipase, and a D-dimer were all within normal limits. She also had a lower extremity duplex. Um, however, uh, she did have a PT that was too high to measure, as well as an INR that was subsequently too high to measure, um, and a PTT of 139. Um, so, you know, normal values with PT should be around uh, 13 or so. PTT should be around 30 or so. Um, the uh, uh, they were worried about how tight that leg was and how uh, pain, how much uh, pain she had with just passive stretch. So they consulted vascular surgery with a concern for compartment syndrome, um, who uh, uh, did agree that uh, this was concerning for compartment syndrome and thought that the patient should undergo a fasciotomy. Um, in preparation for that fasciotomy, uh, they tried to co correct her coagulopathy as best as they could in, his, in as short a period of time um, with this kind of limited uh, information. 
Um, so I'm gonna I'll stop there and and see um, how people would proceed with uh, just with this limited data of correcting this coagulopathy and um, and uh, what other things they would kind of get started for workup. Okay, Denise Fernandez. Denise, are you there? Thought I saw her name. Nope. She's she's on the list, Dr. Goldfrank. Okay, Denise. Okay. So why don't we go to uh, uh is Denise there or not? No. Sage. Hi, hey, sorry, I took a second to get unmuted. Um, yeah, so thinking about this uh, in a young woman uh, who's with no medical problems, so presumably not on any pharmaceuticals, um, I'm thinking about other ways she could have been exposed to an anticoagulant. Uh, and you know, maybe she's one of those people that got into the cannabis that's adulterated with Burdificum. Um, and I think Dr. Goldfrank, I remember you had a, a case that you had as part of your um, plant toxicity lecture with a, a woman who was taking a, a, a tonic that had tonka bean uh, with natural coumarins in it. So I guess that you know some kind of uh, herbal product that that could be uh, affecting her coagulation. Um, I think if you need to rapidly reverse this, I, I think FFP would probably be the the way to go. Um, but uh, um, you know, I, I think that we're basically going to be addressing it uh, potentially like a vitamin K antagonist. So you could also consider K Centra and and uh, giving supplemental vitamin K also. Okay, uh, Zach. Uh, so this uh, that's pretty much how how the team uh, approached it here. So they she got two units of FFP um, and uh, ten milligrams of IV vitamin K. Um, so, uh, and then she uh, subsequently <laughs> went down, got her uh, fasciotomy, and went well, and she was uh, admitted to the floor. Um, I just wanted to to briefly throw this up here, just to uh, just to ch try to uh, think about you know everything that could be gone again. This woman, uh, uh, she said that she did not use drugs, she uh, did not take any medication. So just briefly thinking about things with the basis in the coagulation cascade, which is this is a very simplified diagram, and I won't go through the the, the whole thing. It's just meant to be a launching point to look at. Uh, uh, our toxic differential. So, um, uh, this is especially limited uh, with the with respect to the extrinsic pathway. But essentially, things are cascading down, uh, leading to prothrombin, uh, creating thrombin, which will help the uh, fibrin clots form. Now, I think the, the first thing that Sage mentioned was those vitamin K antagonists. Um, so, uh, these are going to inhibit factors, which are highlighted here, um, and uh, as well as protein C and protein S. They're going to require vitamin K uh, activation. Um, so this is something like a warfarin that's going to inhibit uh, regeneration of that re of that reduced vitamin K. Um, so this is, is a, a diagram from the um, textbook that kind of goes through how this works. So vitamin K um, uh, helps assist with this uh, uh, carboxylation of clotting factors, which activates them. Um, in the act of activating those clotting factors, it goes from its reduced form to its oxidated its oxidized form. Um, and uh, then it uh, needs to be, it's going to be inactive until it gets reduced again. This is done uh, with two enzymatic steps. Um, and these are where your vitamin K antagonists are going to work. Um, and, and just to take a step back from that even further, um, it's, uh, it requires uh, the, the factors have to be um, essentially degraded and, and, and lost before you're going to get this coagulopathy. Um, so, and, and there's a lot of redundancies in the system. So it's important to remember that. And it's probably almost um, makes sense to look all the way over on the right side of the of this graph that you know when you're at 100 percent your uh, your PT is going to be pretty normal and even when you get down to 50 percent uh, your your PT is is still pretty good if you can function well until you get to about 25 percent of your clotting factors um, at which point you're you're going to start to develop coagulopathy pretty quickly um, and pretty severely uh, the uh, uh, factor seven has the shortest half life, and that's one of those vitamin or one of those vitamin K dependent ones. Um, around seven to ten hours, so around fourteen to twenty hours or so, is when you is is when you get to about twenty five percent, and that's kind of when things shoot up. 
Um, we also think about 10A inhibitors. Again, this patient uh, denied being on um, any. She wasn't aware of, of what any <laughs> of, of, of what any of them were. But uh, these are things like urapixaban, urivaroxaban, um, really focusing in more on the on the 10A. Um, also, you have uh, heparin, which this patient really didn't have access to. Um, and this is uh, similar to the low molecular heparin, obviously, but it's just much larger and it's going to act more non-specifically. Um, and then just another thing to consider, and I think this uh, uh, un undifferentiated patient uh, is uh, that uh, uh, you think about venom proteins that could be in play here, um, acting at, at various points along the, the cascade. Um, and I think it's important to think about um, anti uh, the, the anticoagulation studies that you have. Um, so we we PT PTT INR are all for, are all uh, fairly familiar with us and looking at various as aspects of the coagulation cascade, and then um, INR giving us a nice standardized way to represent that between institutions. Um, uh, but even beyond that, some things that we don't normally get right off the bat. You know, think about a mixing study. It's very helpful in determining uh, if there is an inhibitor somewhere in there. So. Uh, this really takes advantage of the fact that based on on that on that prior slide that we were looking at, when you're still at 50%, you still uh, have a fairly good clotting ability. So if you take a patient's uh, blood and mix it with normal blood, you're you're going to be at at least 50%, and you should have good uh, clotting. But if there's an inhibitor in there somewhere, um, that that can still take over the the blood that you're adding in on the other side, and the, and then you can uh, continue to have coagulopathy. You can really test for about pretty much any factor if you. Um, that, that you want to get at. Um, the 10, 9, 7 are usually the ones that we think about most with vitamin K antagonists, but we think about factor 8 um, and factor 9, which are associated with various hemophilias. Uh, factor 8 is also a little bit helpful kind of down the road as it's made throughout the body, um, and factor 5 um, uh, is made by the liver. Um, the anti, you can also send off specific medications uh, or anything that you're, anything that you're uh, kind of thinking of. Um, so uh, I'll I'll stop there. We were, we actually were not uh, contacted at that point. We were contacted here um, at, at post op day one when uh, after hematology had weighed in and asked that they send off a, a bunch of labs because they were, were worried that this could be a, a vitamin K um, antagonist. Um, so the, the, the after uh, the patient was corrected and went down to the OR, um, they drew labs uh, after the procedure. She had an INR of uh, two point seven again from greater than nine. Um, they had a mixing study without a correction, um, and she was low in factor 10, 9, and 7, um, but uh, had uh, with the normal ages for uh, 8 and 5. Um, so, again, this is where we were consulted, um, and I'd be curious kind of where, where people would go in terms of their uh, recommendations uh, at this point. Okay, so <clears throat> we can go back to, uh, uh, how about Josh Nogar? What do you think? Josh, there. Are you there? Okay, maybe not. William Chang is there, I think. I think I know about William? this. I know about this case already. You do? Okay. How, how about Vince Colello then, who doesn't maybe know about the case? Go ahead, Vince. Are you there? No answer from Vince. I'm not doing well. Uh, so uh, I'll find someone for you. How about Ruben? Okay, good. I didn't Ru see Ruben Olmedo. Yeah, we, I'm just taking a look at those labs. It the, the, seems like the coagulopathy has improved with uh, some of the. <clears throat> Uh, things that we had given her, but her INR is still elevated. She still has a coagulopathy, and they're, they're still thinking of doing any kind of procedure. I would still be worried about some more bleeding, so um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be ready to send her more. Maybe she need. She would need more FFP of vitamin K. Okay. I think she needs vitamin K and lots of it. And. <clears throat> Who's that, Suzanne? Yes, Dr. Goldfrank. I mean, the factor one level is 1% according to this. I mean, I think the proof is there. Um, 
And so I would assume this is a vitamin K antagonist overdose. I don't know what the circumstances were. Was she suicidal and took a lot of Perdificum? I have no idea. But um, there's definitely a huge deficiency, deficiency excuse me, of factor seven. Um, and so you can give her more concentra since the INR is 2.7, but ultimately she's gonna need a lot of vitamin K and, and maybe for a long time if it's Perdificum, um, but it needs to be investigated a little bit as to what it is that she took. And then the correct dose of, of vitamin K needs to be determined for her. Um, they do range a lot. So. so would you have sent her down to the floor by herself? From the operating room? Yes. Uh, um, yeah, well, a lot of, well, it depends what her hemoglobin is. It depends if she was transfused uh, blood during the surgery. It depends what her blood pressure is, if she's tachycardic. It depends if I have a clear history of what the overdose was. Um, she hasn't but, admitted to an overdose as yet. Yeah, I know, I know. If there was an overdose, again, I don't even know. So, so maybe because there are so many unknowns, I would keep her in a monitored setting until I can clarify these issues and get the CINR, and again, ideally under 1.5 uh, or something like that. Um, so maybe because of all these unknowns, I would keep her in a monitored setting, but I think we must investigate how she got there. And, and again, the answer might be a lot of vitamin K for treating it. Okay, Zach? Yeah, that's that's uh, really, I think, in line with, uh, with what uh, we ultimately said, you know, we, we agree this, this seems like it's consistent with a vitamin K antagonist. Uh, we were at this point, we, we had the, we had the benefit of kind of knowing her hospital setting and everything and, and thought that, uh, you know, she's, she's one day out. We still don't know exactly what, uh, what may or may not have been adjusted. Um, hopefully it's just something like warfarin that's going to clear pretty quickly. So we said, let's just hold and kind of see where it was. We had the ability to get uh, pretty frequent lab tests. So we just kind of held on. Um, and we advised that the team send off like a, a, a warfarin level and, uh, long acting anticoagulant super warfarin levels as well. Um, and uh, this was kind of in the evening. The next day, uh, uh, we checked in on her and her INR had increased uh, back up greater than nine, her PTT um, too high to detect and her, uh, her, her, sorry, PT too high to detect and her PTT 58. Um, it was at this point we were able to go uh, actually meet her. Um, uh, struck us as uh, quite frankly, a very uh, normal uh, uh, a woman who was uh, very excited about a lot of the things that she had to live for. Um, she denied any sort of uh, ingestion. Uh, she said that the symptoms really came on pretty quickly over just a couple of days. Uh, she didn't really have any atypical exposures to clean the house a couple of days ago, but nothing new. Um, she did say that you, she used hookah about a week ago, but used it with a bunch of people and nobody else really had any problems. And and kind of during that setting a week ago as well, had had a big uh, meal with the group. Um, but again, no one else was ill. Um, she, uh, from an occupational perspective, just has a, a customer facing job, doesn't have her involved in chemicals or you know, deep cleaning or anything like that, and really hadn't traveled anywhere. Um, so at this point, uh, given that she was two days out, we were worried about a long-term vitamin K antagonist, and we uh, recommended based on uh, some cases that we had had before uh, that she start on 50 milligrams of vitamin K uh, Q6, which she was able to take orally. So this is a summary, a summary of the rest of her hospital course uh, over a little bit over two weeks um, that I tried to condense down here as much as I could. Um, so she was, she was started on that medication for our recommendations and then uh, kind of without us knowing, they decided to just switch her to 50 milligrams daily, um, at which point social work and uh, case management started to meet with the patient a little bit more um, uh, aggressively. Um, we saw that we, we didn't see that at the time. We saw that the next day and, she, and, and uh, her INR was still uh, was still doing well. Um, so we at least advised them to change to 25 milligrams BID because there is some limit to uh, PO absorption. Um, after she was on that for another day, um, her INR was 1.3, you know, and at this point we were a little bit con confused, didn't know exactly what was going on because this did seem like the system of the vitamin K antagonist. Um, uh, and usually in the more, um, in the super warfarins, uh, it seemed to, uh, um, those generally required a little bit more than we were giving her. So we thought maybe this is just warfarin. Um, we said, let's hold and see what happens. Uh, but then her INR uh, started to increase again the next day. Um, and uh, she was restarted on the 25 milligrams BID. Um, on day eight, uh, we learned that her um, her send out panels had come back positive for bromodialone, which is a super warfarin um, uh, and rodenticide. 
Um, at that point, a more serious investigation um, was started kind of from a legal perspective. And then medically after that, she did well on her 25 milligrams BID, um, ultimately had a closure of her fasciotomy and was discharged home. Um, but I think that that led us uh, uh, to a tough uh, question of what to do um, in terms of a, a, an outpatient strategy here. Um, I'd be uh, curious if other people had experience with this type of thing um, and um, and what uh, what the, what the, what strategies that, that that they've used. Okay, so Kathleen, is this a homicide, attempted homicide, or is this suicide? She took it. Kathleen Clancy. Sorry, just unmuting. Sorry, just unmuting. It's a very interesting case. Uh, I'm glad there's an investigation. I guess I would go check out the hookah lab, the hookah place, and see if there's any chance that rat poison had been put in their tobacco or whatever leafy product they were burning. Um, and then beyond that, I guess I would check her, have them check her close associates to see if anybody else is bromodialone positive. But in terms of how long to leave her on the vitamin K, I mean, we have some experience with the vit with the um, brodificum laced spice, and it was on the order of months, so two, three months. So the most important thing, I think, is that someone follow her carefully, because they could try stopping the vitamin K at any time, as long as they can track her INR. I mean, it's kind of nice to have a a level you can track. It's it's not a hard thing to do. Keep her on vitamin K, take her off of oral vitamin K, check the INR. The problem that I think you might run into is vitamin K can be very expensive. That's the problem we ran into with the uh, the Bradificum. And so there were a lot of people who were considering using veterinary product instead. And that came with a host of ethical questions. So, what, what, Kathleen, what are you saying one should do about one should do about one should do about supervision? Or I don't know how well did one talk about the potential for suicide or the, something that was uh, done and we hadn't elicited it from the patient as yet. How would you push ahead? Well, I would have psychiatry talk to her a lot. Um, obviously, that's a question. I thought she wasn't didn't seem suicidal at all. So that is a question for psychiatry. I mean, someone needs to spend a lot more time with her than I would ever be likely to spend. So I'd have to join our colleagues in that kind of discussion. And I'll tell you on that perspective, uh, yeah, there was a lot of conversations uh, that, that they had and she was ultimately uh, cleared from psychiatry. I mean, that doesn't mean she didn't take the rat poison, but it means we have to look thoroughly in other directions. I mean, most people are not suicidal. We seem to think most people are suicidal, but they aren't really. So I think in the absence, you have to go look for some other source. Usually in the mysteries, one's gonna ask about the ex-boyfriend or the other people in the system. Right. Okay, Josh. I mean, Zach, carry okay. on. Yeah, so our... Our strategy, you know, we knew, we knew that she was cleared by psychiatry. Um, we knew that uh, there was an investigation that was ongoing um, outside of the hospital. So our, our strategy from a medical perspective was to send her home on that same dose of vitamin K. Home, on that same word. Home, that's at the time, at the time. Sorry, I got some echo here. Try to stop for a second. Um, and then, um, and then check an INR uh, weekly and try to decrease the dose by five milligrams um, uh, every week as long as the INR was okay. Um, and I'll tell you, kind of throughout, uh, we've been in contact for uh, almost two months now, and we actually just came off of the um, just came off of the vitamin K last week, and we're due for an INR check here um, uh, tomorrow. So we'll see if we're see if we're done. Um, but she was able to successfully um, at least wean down to a very small dose um, after about uh, two months. 
Um, and, you know, just to bring up uh, vitamin, uh, talk about vitamin K antagonists for, for a minute more, you know, we can we think about uh, warfarin is the thing that we most commonly see. And I think a lot of us have a, a good pathway for what to do when you get a warfarin. And, and it's generally uh, something that's uh, usually fairly uh, straightforward. It's something that you can rapidly correct if you need to. Um, and the, the drug effect itself is usually pretty short lived. Um, but, you know, I guess this has a little bit of caveat that it's tricky because people are usually on warfarin for a reason. So you got to think about overcorrecting and, and, and how to manage that. But this is uh, definitely in contrast to the super warfarins, and I just have a few of them um, up there, but uh, these are uh, typically used in rodenticides in very small concentrations. Um, um, uh, something uh, so that uh, if you're generally ingested accidentally by a, by a small human, is usually not that big of a deal because um, usually they're done in small doses. And, and you see warfarin here is on the bottom and verdificum is on the top. So really you're looking at this uh, higher molecular weight thing um, that's going to be more lipid soluble and concentrate in the liver better, um, have more potent and longer lasting effects. Uh, Bromodylone itself, we were trying to figure out maybe is there is there a way that we can uh, end this early, um, but we found some uh, what we found was some variability in, in, in elimination, um, and uh, we try to get a, quanti a quantitative level, which in the past has been shown to be useful, um, uh, but we were unable to to do that. Um, the um, it, there is some evidence that maybe this is a two compartment model with a fairly steep decrease in the higher concentrations, but then a, 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 pro a more uh, prolonged um, termination phase of, of, of maybe a few months. Um, and it, uh, Kathleen, you brought up a lot of great points about. Uh, about the treatment of these, this can last months and may require massive doses of vitamin K. Um, and this is a strain on the patient on the pharmacy. Um, and you really you have to divide the doses out because of the GI absorption. And, um, and also the, the metabolism is uh, fairly unpredictable. There's, uh, there's uh, variable expressions of the CYP3A4. Um, uh, so uh, people have talked about uh, for these long acting anticoagulant patients in using phenobarbital for, uh, to induce that enzyme, um, which maybe anecdotally has worked maybe a few times, but it's never been systematically studied. And I think, as you pointed out, it, very expensive. Um, you know, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars to maintain somebody on 50 milligrams, you know, uh, QID for months. Um, so people have uh, discussed a lot of different ways to do it. Um, yeah, IV costs about half. Some people have been looking at using that orally. Um, people have talked about just trying to buy as much of it as you can <laughs> online, um, which uh, um, maybe is ultimately a little bit cheaper. And then, like you mentioned, using veterinary vitamin K actually has a, a significant uh, significant dose. Uh, you know, this $18 uh, veterinary thing that you can just buy online uh, would is uh, translatable to about two th or six thousand dollars of the prior prescription, um, and it's uh, beef flavored, I guess. But uh, but yeah, it has some some ethical uh, implications there, uh, absolutely. Uh, so uh, you know things come in uh, things come in sequence, and I was worried that we uh, were going down a same a similar route uh, when I had another uh, patient who came through. Uh, he's a uh, 66 year old guy with a number of comorbidities uh, who ended up coming in with painful hematuria. Um, his vital signs are also okay, an unremarkable physical exam. Um, similar kind of workup. He had an INR that was too high to detect PT, is too high to detect PTT um, that was elevated as well. Um, he had a bunch of red cells in his urine, uh, but his CT was unremarkable, didn't show any stones or anything. Um, <clears throat> This patient again denied any sort of ingestions, anything that was really atypical outside of his uh, normal day to day life. Um, his medications are uh, on the side here. He's on aspirin, but uh, um, nothing else that would, that would cause too much of a problem. So I'm going to stop there and see just with the, with this guy, as uh, an, old, an older person with a number of comorbidities, if anybody would have a, a different uh, approach, different considerations, or things to add to the differential um, in addition to, to what. Uh, what we've talked about already with the prior case. Um, well, I guess Suzanne and Kathleen are there. Anybody wants to comment? Still would be thinking about warfarin. I would be thinking about all the long acting anticoagulants. I would be thinking about, you know, some kind of dietary supplement that contains some of those naturally occurring coumarins. Uh, the DOAX or NOAX, whatever you want to call them, the, the novel anti Coagulants don't usually get the INR this high, uh, but um, that would be something to consider as well. Um, you know, that's what I'm coming up with. I guess huge, huge, uh, really 
very vitamin K deficient person might might present with an elevated INR, although I don't think it would be elevated to this degree. Um, so that's something else to consider. Yeah, I guess one of the things I would ask him if he was in front of me is if he'd ever had a blood clot or he'd ever been in atrial fibrillation or, you know, in his in his prior 20 years, you know, if anything had occurred where he might have had warfarin sitting around in his house. Because this certainly smacks of warfarin. So, Zach, is this the father of the woman? No, it is. It is not. I, I was. I definitely uh, did a double check on the last names on the uh, on the chart when I when I was looking through it, but it was not. And uh, as far as far as we know, there was no uh, there was no warfarin in the house. He has not been on that. He's he had no. He did not have a history of uh, atrial fibrillation. Um, and I saw. I was just pulling up the the chat here. Uh, no uh, no uh, daptomycin uh, treatment uh, in in either in either of the patients as well. Um, so. I'm just going to to jump in here. Uh, he was given uh, 10 milligrams of PO vitamin K and admitted to the hospital and a whole bunch of factor levels were sent. Uh, very, uh, kind of approached it similarly, at least from, from our prior patients. Um, ultimately, those were consistent with the vitamin K antagonist. In the morning, his INR was uh, close to normal. Um, so the medicine, th medicine team thought that he was uh, okay to go home. Uh, we thought that there was a lot of questions left unanswered here, um, so we had the patient come back. Um, ultimately, came in two days after he was discharged. At that point, he was totally asymptomatic, um, and we did a recheck of his INR, uh, and it was 3.15. Now, the interesting addition here is that we had a patient bring in all of his medications, and depending on the brightness of your screen, you may not be able to see too, may, may not be able to see this too well, but on the left side. Um, these are the patient's uh, uh, pills. This is what he said his Jardians was. Uh, but when you look up Jardians, it actually is this pill here. Um, uh, and what this looks more like is the is really identical to this Gentovin, which is on the bottom here, which is a generic warfarin. Um, so at that point, we realized that the probable etiology here is that the patient uh, the patient received incorrect uh, medications. Uh, so he was admitted to the hospital, um, watched his INR downtrended, and he was discharged the next day with uh, primary care follow-up. Now, I, I, I was able to reach out to the pharmacy where the patient filled this medications, and it seems like this is a good example of a Swiss cheese model just kind of sliding uh, sliding right through. Um, probably the case of uh, a case of a technician that grabbed the wrong bottle and just and it not being caught. Um, so they're officially reviewing the case in a few days, but uh, they said preliminarily um, the the kind of picture here was probably that there, there's an automated robot that fills a number of their fast moving prescriptions or their high risk prescriptions. So warfarin falls into that category. Um, and then they'll have stock bottles that'll refill the robot. Um, Jardians is not uh, high risk or, or fast moving. Um, so those are done by hand. Um, uh, in this particular case, they think that the technician grabbed the wrong bottle um, and, and Put the pills out now. The pharmacist uh, should verify this. Usually, they recognize the pills, or you know, they're, they're doing this all the time. Um, uh, and the and the bottle should also be in the bin with the drug that they're reviewing. In this case, they don't think that the bottle was in, was in the bit was in the bin. Um, so that ultimately led to them actually um, grabbing then that Gentovin, um, putting it in where the pharmacist thought there was Jardians, uh, not realizing that error. There's no scanning involved in this process. Um, it's just all visual um, and. Uh, and then that patient ultimately getting the wrong medication. Um, and it's it's easy to see. This is just a, a quick search that I, that I went through through uh, um, the Institute for Safe Medication Practices uh, as a list of commonly confused drugs. And this Jantovin, which I was not familiar with before this case, uh, can certainly be um, confused for a number of different drugs. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll stop there and see if anybody has questions on either this case or the prior one. I don't know if Brenna Farmer is on the line or not. I didn't see her name. Brenna's not here today, Dr. Goldfrank. How about Silas? You want to make any comments about this? This technology? I mean, I think it was appropriately reviewed. To, I mean, the most important thing was to see what exactly the patient was taking. So. Congratulations to the uh, individuals who actually went through and did real med reconciliations, uh, as as well as uh, 
I mean, I think we've discussed before a, a host of issues of look-alike, sound-alike substitution uh, issues with uh, uh, with pharmaceuticals. Okay. Yes, we agree. It's re remarkable. Okay, Zach, carry on. That was that was where I was going. So I will stop there and then just pass over to Dr. Hansen. Well, where's that poor young woman? Uh, she, she's doing she's doing well. I've been uh, I've been in touch with her. Um, we're we're going to talk tomorrow to see what the what the latest INR is. But she's uh, she was able to come off of the vitamin K um, and give that a give that a shot. So we'll see if it worked for the week. So what um, do you think happened? Actually? The investigation the investigation itself, she said, is is ongoing, and and she was told to expect that it's that it to be a fairly drawn out uh, process. Um, I don't think that they have any, uh, it doesn't sound like they have any uh, very strong leads as to exactly what happened. Um, my, my initial Im impression of her just uh, quite honestly is that uh, she, she did not seem suicidal and she, she was very consistent with that fact. So I, I think that this got in somehow um, and I suspect it was from someone else, but. Awesome wanted to say something about this. I mean, it, he wants to know the Munchausen or was there something uh... Not, nothing you could find. Yeah, nothing we could find. Uh, to be honest with you, we, I I was um, um, uh, her story seemed consistent, reasonable, and she and she seemed the, seemed the same too. So if um, so, yeah, it's it's. Uh, I guess you can't know for sure, but um, but she seemed fairly reliable. Awesome. You wanted to say something? Yeah. The question is, what was uh, how was his sugar? Did he notice? Gee, I'm taking my medication and my sugar is not getting so well controlled. That's um, on the it, it was it was a little bit elevated. He wasn't uh, so focused on that um, as he was on the on the bleeding, though. Sure, but no, maybe that will be sometimes sign that maybe you're not receiving right medication. Nothing changed in your life. You are not sick with anything. You have same diet. And yeah, that's a good point. The medication you're supposed to take is not doing it. Okay, so let's All go right. on. Sarah is next. Hungry. All right. Hi, my name is Sarah Mahansky. I'm one of the second year fellows and my case today is entitled hungry, hungry hippo. So this case starts with a 2 year old male who was brought into the emergency department with his mother by ambulance with shaking movements. Uh, about one hour prior to the symptom onset, mom reported she gave him a vitamin supplement that was meant for appetite stimulation. She had gotten this, um, this vitamin from a friend in Puerto Rico. They are originally from uh, Puerto Rico. And the child presented with abnormal shaking movements, changes to behavior, as well as crying. Past medical history, this is a previously healthy full-term two-year-old who has had appropriate prenatal care had been meeting milestones. Uh, of note, this child actually weighed 15 kilos, which is pretty appropriate for a two-year-old. Uh, mom said that he was a picky eater, which is why she gave him this uh, vitamin. He really liked Doritos, but wasn't so much a fan of uh, vegetables. And um, just looking through the medical record, he had had a couple ED visits for viral syndromes, but no other major uh, medical illnesses. So on arrival to the emergency department, uh, he is tachycardic with a heart rate of 157. Uh, otherwise, normal respiratory rate, temperature, oxygen, and blood pressure for age. On a physical examination, uh, pupils are dilated and non-reactive. He's noted to have dry lips as well as mucous membranes. He's tachycardic with a regular um, rhythm, normal respirations and abdominal examination. Skin appears flushed. And on neurologic examination, this child is alert with some occasional twitching movements, a bit of difficulty with coordination, uh, and as well as intermittent crying and agitation. So the team was able to uh, get an EKG, which is shown here. I'll give you a minute. I know these pediatric EKGs are always a little unfamiliar to us. And uh, here's the child's lab work. So um, pretty unremarkable CBC. Um, chemistry with a mild anion gap, uh, metabolic acidosis, um, LFTs were normal, acetaminophen, salicylates, and ethanol were also negative, and a urine drug screen uh, showed positive for TCA. 
So I'm going to pause here and see what you all think. Sarah, just before that, you you said it was difficult to interpret the ECG. Maybe you should tell us the answer then. So there are a lot. You went pretty fast for. Oh, sorry. So um, not not anything tricky here. I just know that for those of us who see mainly adults, um, this might look a little bit unusual for uh, an adult because there are some T wave inversions. But um, this looks like a um, a normal pediatric EKG. Just shows um, some juvenile T wave inversions. It shows a normal QRS, normal QTC, and just some sinus tachycardia. Okay, great. So Brian Schultz is there. He's in some pediatric toxicology. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it seems very anti-muscarinic in nature. I'm just interested in plus the positive TCA study uh, makes me think somehow the child was given some form of anti-muscarinic agent instead of a vitamin. Um, could be that something with uh, diphenhydramine um, in it or doxylamine. I'm not sure being a vitamin supplement plus, um, you know, from Puerto Rico, I'm not sure what the child could have taken. Uh, could have been some form of plant material um, or some type of other herbal contaminant with some type of anti-muscarinic or um, uh, atropine-like alkaloid um, in there. But certainly the, the child seems to be developing anti-muscarinic toxicity with dry skin, flushed skin, vidriasis, tachycardia, um, some form of, um, you know, atropine type alkaloid, belladonna type alkaloid. Okay, we'll get one other, we have another pediatrician. Jeff Fine, you know this case or not? Um, I don't know this case specifically, but I agree that it looked very uh, anti-muscarinic almost classic toxidrome. Um, you know, so then the question is, is the urine uh, drug screen positive for tricyclic antidepressant? Is it is it a true positive? Is it a false positive or is it a cross reacting agent that would show up on the urine drug screen as a tricyclic? And a lot of those antihistamines um, do show up as as uh, tricyclics on the urine drug screen. Not a lot, some of them. Okay, thanks, Sarah. All right, so uh, this was called into toxicology uh, in the after hours. So this child wasn't immediately seen at the bedside, but we uh, agreed with all of your thoughts that this child definitely sounded anti-muscarinic um, without uh, initially at the time of consult knowing the exact drug because it was, uh, um, not something that we were familiar with and the positive urine TCA, we recommended that this child was admitted um, for hydration and observation and did not recommend physostigmine as we weren't really positive of the initial uh, exposure. Uh, some of the things that we had uh, you know, thought about in terms of appetite stimulants, um, mirtazapine is uh, an antidepressant that's commonly used in adults uh, and has the side effect of appetite stimulation. And given the structure looking similar to a TCA, it can cause that false positive urine TCA. Um, dronabinol, um, the urine was negative for THC, but this is also an appetite stimulant. And sometimes patients who are THC um, exposed can look a little bit anti-muscarinic, so that was also considered. Uh, Magestrol is a progesterone supplement, and oxandrolone is a uh, medication for appetite stimulation for patients who need weight gain after surgery. Um, neither of those really fit the clinical picture. I see in the chat box, uh, Sage Wiener had mentioned ciproheptadine, which is a medication that we use for serotonin toxicity as well as some other off-label uses that is used in pediatrics for um, appetite stimulation on occasion and, and can cause a positive urine TCA and also um, an anti-muscarinic picture and overdose. So that was also highly considered. Some of the things I found online in terms of things people might buy over the counter that are vitamins that might affect appetite, uh, zinc, thiamine, and some bitters, I uh, really wouldn't think that would explain um, this presentation. Um, the child was admitted and didn't initially have any benzodiazepine requirements, just was maintained with um, reassurance. So after our morning bedside consult, we were able to talk a little bit more with mom and she was able to get someone to bring in this vitamin and it was called Apitin, which was a vitamin, uh, uh, it was described to us as a vitamin uh, used for appetite stimulation. And a friend had given her the packet that you see on the left, 
which kind of looks like one of those emergency packets that you dissolve in liquid and then drink it. So she had put this in uh, an orange juice and given it to her child. If you actually look this medication up, um, it comes with a bottle of solution and you're supposed to dissolve this packet in 240 milliliters of solution. And the dose that's recommended is five milliliters. And if you flip the packet around, um, the top ingredient is dihexazine three milligrams. And I'm not familiar with what dihexazine is. Um, I am familiar with the other ingredients of thiamine, riboflavin, nicotinamide, pyridoxine, and vitamin C. Um, but if you do a little bit of a Google search, dihexazine is actually ciproheptadine. Um, each dose is supposed to be three milligrams of dihexazine or ciproheptadine, which is about what you'd expect for a, a dose for appetite um, stimulation if you're using this in a pediatric setting. However, she had given this child the whole 240 milligram uh, milliliter dose, which equates to 144 milligrams of ciproheptadine. So about a 48 fold um, overdose. So ciproheptadine, um, and I apologize about the slide formatting. It looked a little different on my laptop um, in terms of fonts, but ciproheptadine, um, although we think about it for serotonin um, toxicity, it is actually on the, the FDA label insert um, marketed for allergic conditions because although it does have anti-serotonergic properties, it's also an antihistamine. Um, some of the off-label uses, if you look on something like UpToDate, includes appetite stimulation, particularly in, particularly in pediatrics, um, dyspepsia, migraine prevention, cyclic vomiting syndrome, and spasticity. The pharmacokinetics of ciproheptadine, it does undergo hepatic glucuronidation, and the metabolites of this drug peak at six to nine hours, and the metabolites themselves have a half-life of about 16 hours. Um, so taking that into effect and looking at, you know, some prior um, case literature, this case report described a five-year-old who had ingested anywhere from 16 to 20 tablets of four milligram ciproheptadine, had a confirmatory level that proved exposure, um, came in very anti-muscarinic, was treated supportively, but symptoms lasted about 24 hours. So that kind of played into, when I get back to the case, how we treated this patient. Um, the other interesting aspect of this case is that mom had initially reported uh, this child was given a vitamin. And um, we know that vitamins are, you know, part of, um, it's it dif difficult to um, regulate vitamins as part of the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994. This was passed to help um, improve the regulation over vitamins after um, the eosinophilia myalgia syndrome that was thought to be due to contaminants from L-tryptophan. So the goal of this act was to give the FDA a little bit more control over vitamins. Uh, however, they're still pretty uh, limited, limitedly regulated. So um, the marketers and producers of these vitamins and supplements don't have to prove that they're efficacious for a particular um, you know, problems such as appetite stimulation, unless they're marketed towards a disease. Um, and unfortunately, this act only gives the FDA um, the ability to um, regulate vitamins after there's been proved adverse events and sort of post-marketing surveillance. So it's sort of um, reactive instead of proactive. Um, so thinking that this was a vitamin, this, this supplement the child took seemed to kind of break some of the regulations that are reported in DSHA. And um, given this happened in Puerto Rico, I had to look up whether the FDA has control over Puerto Rico and other U.S. territories, and the answer is yes. Um, it turns out that when you actually look at the fine print on this medication, it's actually a prescription medication, which is uh, reassuring to us. However, she did not obtain it through prescription avenues, so that was addressed through um, some social work um, and patient education. And just to wrap up this case, um, we did not initially recommend physostigmine. I think after we discovered what this drug was, there really wasn't any contraindication to physostigmine. The EKG showed a narrow QRS, um, no evidence of any sodium channel blockade. Because this child didn't really require benzodiazepines and um, was able to be um, you know, reassured uh, otherwise, we didn't end up giving physostigmine and the child was uh, by 36 hours discharged. We also worried if we gave Pfizer, given the long um, duration of action of this medication, they may need repeat dosing. Um, so we chose just supportive care and that worked out just fine. So the child was discharged at about 36 hours. That's uh, all I have for you. Happy to answer any questions if anyone has any. Great. So Sarah, was it manufactured in, in the United States and Puerto Rico or was it uh, did come from some other country where it was written in Spanish? 
Um, the uh, actual packet that the parent had was in Spanish and I was able to look up the package insert in English, but this was made. Um, it looks like in the Dominican Republic. But it so was that, obtained in Puerto Rico. So it, I guess it's, it's good to recognize that probably it would have been controlled potentially and came in without, a, without a prescription. That it? That's a good point. Okay. Great case. Everybody was thinking clearly about it. So let's do the last case for the day. Probably uh, we'll let Brian speak next. Thanks a lot. Hello. I'm Brian again, one of the first here at Cox Palace. For those of you who don't know me, and without further ado, let's get right into it. So, our patient is a 30 year old female who was brought in by EMS for an intentional overdose of an unknown amount of multiple medications in a suicide attempt. The patient was contemplating hurting herself, so she called her psychiatrist, who subsequently called EMS. En route to the hospital, the patient was giving 20 milligrams of midazolam by EMS for agitation as she was not cooperating in the field. Her ED triage vitals are noted on the slide. She was noted to be tachycardic, but her, her other vitals were within normal limits. This patient had a pretty complex medical history, history of Brugada with an implanted AICD. She had Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, an MYLK gene mutation, which we'll talk a little bit more, more about later, but it's essentially an, a myosin-like kinase gene. It modulates the calcium and calmodulin-dependent myosin-like chain kinase, which phosphorylates the regulatory-like chain to initiate contraction in smooth muscles. She also had severe gastroparesis, anemia, anxiety, depression, borderline personality disorder with multiple prior self-harm attempts. This patient, for a 30-year-old female, had quite an extensive medication list. Um, I'll keep it on the screen just for a second to absorb what she was taking. Um, while everyone looks at them, I'll speak for a second about some of them. Levomilnasopram is the enantiomer of milnasopram, the SNRI that we're familiar with. Carisoprodol is a muscle relaxant. Tizanidine is light clonidine, alpha-2 adrenergic agonist. Linaclotide is a drug used for IBS, and valbenazine is a medication used to treat tardive dyskinesia. Um, Suvorexin is another medication which helps sleep, promote sleeping. But uh, this patient, very uh, extensive medication list for a 30-year-old female. Clearly had access to a lot of meds. Um, her physical exam in the emergency room. She was tearful. She had a large body habitus, moist mucous membranes, her pupils were four millimeters equal round reactive to light. She was tachycardic without murmurs. Her lungs were clear to auscultation. She had a soft abdomen with normal bowel sounds, multiple prior self-inflicted wounds, and her neuro exam was relatively normal aside from the fact that she was sleepy. Her EKG upon presentation to the ER was as you see above. I will say that the QRS, despite being slightly wide at 108, and having a terminal R wave and AVR was actually identical to a QRS from one year prior, which showed the same tall R wave and AVR. And her, Q her calculated QTC per Radha was 362. Here were her initial labs. She had somewhat of an anemia with a hemoglobin of 10.2 and a hematocrit of 36. She had a chloride of 109. And she was slightly acidemic with a pH of 7.29 with a PCO2 of 51 and a lactate of 2.5. She had a detectable ETOH level of 198, but her labs were otherwise relatively normal. I'm not going to stop here, but the ED was thinking what to do. I'm going to stop in a, in a couple slides. And the initial plan was to essentially put this patient on one-to-one, -one, continuous cardiac monitoring, obtain a four-hour acetaminophen level, they gave a liter of fluid, consulted toxicology, and admitted the patient to telemetry. The patient remained stable in the emergency room over on the cardiac monitor overnight. Her repeat vitals nine hours post-ingestion 
showed a blood pressure of 83 over 50, a heart rate of 40 to 50. She was somnolent but arousable. Ano times three had some dizziness and lightheadedness. And now the patient said maybe she took some diltiazem, clonidine, alprazolam, and oxycodone. So I will open up to the audience. What would you do with that situation right now? And I'll okay. come back to her meds while we answer that question. Sage, what do you think? Um, I think this could be certainly consistent with the diltiazem and the uh, the clonidine, at least the the part that's happening nine hours later. Although the clonidine, I probably wouldn't expect it to be delayed that much, so probably more likely the diltiazem. Um, it, it there was no GI decontamination that was done on this patient. She was given a fifty grams of activated charcoal, but she did not tolerate it very well, and they're not really sure if she got any of it. Yeah. So I mean, at this point, I think uh, I would start. Uh, some of our options for for calcium channel blocker toxicity and and uh, see how the patient responded. I'd probably start with some calcium uh, and would be thinking about trying to get uh, high dose insulin started uh, and and potentially pressors if the patient was responding wasn't responding to those things. Okay, <clears throat> Rich Hamilton, you agree with that? Well, it's hard not to, but um, I my brain got stuck on the 20 milligrams of Versed that's sitting somewhere in her muscle. Um, I, I guess the easiest approach would be to just control the airway and get started on on a CCB toxicity uh, resuscitation. But I don't feel like I still really know what's going on with this patient, to be honest. Okay, so he's leaving it up to you, Brian. Well, I will say something that distracted the team in the emergency room initially was the patient actually admitted to taking clonidine in the emergency room. And the team was very focused on clonidine. They gave the patient a liter of fluid, some atropine, and those were most of the treatments because for the first eight to 12 hours overnight, the patient was actually doing really well just on some fluid and atropine. Unfortunately, 10 hours into her hospital stay, that was when everything deteriorated and she had these labs. And then they're like, wait, this doesn't make sense. Clonidine doesn't usually have such a delayed effect. Did you actually take anything else? And she said, no, maybe I took some diltiazem, uh, clonidine, alprazolam, and oxycodone. And all of them are sedating. We definitely think about diltiazem in our tox brady, hypotension, bradycardia. So the team in the emergency room actually consulted cardiology and these these were some of the later labs the patient had a elevated lactate to 1.6 then 12 hours later it started becoming a little more acidemic with a ph of 7.26 a pco2 of 51 and a lactate of 1.4 going back to our medication list one more look over here Cardiology came down, saw this patient. This is before toxicology was called to bedside, and they set the pacer of this patient to pace at a rate of 80. Additionally, they gave calcium gluconate, some extra fluid, atropine, glucagon, and they admitted the patient to the MICU. After cardiology set the pacer to pace at a rate of 80, we can here is a, an EKG which is actually showing ventricular capture after the patient was paced. And she had a heart rate of 80, but her blood pressure was borderline pretty soft. Her MAP was just above 65, but the patient was becoming more lethargic and less responsive to questions. So I wanna stop there and ask, how do people feel about treating a patient who is hypotensive and bradycardic with a pacer? Kathleen, Clancy? here um well bradycardia oops bradycardia in the face of hypotension is often treated with a pacer this patient is a special patient because she already had a pacer right so her aicd i'm gathering was a pacer so it's a little bit of a different scenario in your brain than if you're going to try to transcutaneously pace someone with a BMI of over 40, that's not going to happen. So you would have had to get a 
you know, a pace cardiology would put a pacer in. So I don't think I would have paced her right away, except since she has a pacer inside, I, I think it's okay to try and see if when you correct her bradycardia, if her blood pressure can, comes up. I, I don't think there's any harm in that, but it didn't work. And neither did the atropine work. So I think you have to start looking for other ideas. I'm a little surprised that the emergency department didn't just try a large dose of naloxone, you know, 10 milligrams of naloxone to see, I mean, it, it doesn't always fix the cardiac manifestations of clonidine, but she was on two different kinds of clonidine agent, you know, alpha agonist. So it might've helped, would have been an idea, but I, I think you're right to go forth and treat her calcium channel blocker. Okay. And Awesome agrees with naloxone. He thought about naloxone. Okay, speak up. So Brian. Yeah. Okay. So um, so this this case did not turn out very well. The patient, despite having an adequate heart rate in the 80s, and then cardiology actually came down again and reset the pacer to 110. The patient had hypotension, developed PEA arrest, got intubated in ROS 25 minutes later. She was then maxed out on norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dobutamine. They put her on ECMO, but cannulation was unsuccessful, and it was complicated by right leg ischemia. They were unable to put the ECMO circuit in because of her high pressure requirement. She was then transferred to the CCU, where she was persistently hypotensive on three pressors. So phenylephrine and methylene blue were added on as well, in addition to high-dose insulin. The patient was actually found to have abdominal compartment syndrome. Surgery came down and did a bedside exploratory laparotomy in the ICU and excised a significant amount of ischemic bowel. She started developing kidney failure and was placed on CDVH, but she couldn't tolerate CRRT given her low ECMO flow. She had worsening ischemia and ultimately she was taken off ECMO and supportive care, and she died four days after presentation. We went back and we thought about what went wrong, and it makes sense looking back on it that this probably was a calcium channel blocker overdose. We're not sure the ME concentrations, uh, blood concentrations of clonidine and deltaism are still pending, but the fact that the patient initially reported clonidine, we believe was a distraction. Her initial hypertension might have been consistent with that, which is something caused by clonidine, other contributing factors here that went wrong was this patient had severe gastroparesis, so it could have extended the time that the typical time frame we're used to for drug toxicities to take effect. This patient's MYLK gene mutation might have also made her more susceptible to calcium channel blocker overdoses. But something that really was tricky is throughout the night, she had a borderline blood pressure, but her heart rate was never bradycardic. It was initially in. From the time cardiology paced it, they paced it at a rate of 80, and then she was getting worse, so then they paced it at a rate of 110. So we were dealing with a patient who was hypotensive but was never bradycardic. And I think that combined with the patient telling the team she overdosed on clonidine really put distractors on the case that people weren't going full court press immediately with high dose insulin on this patient. Uh, we can make an argument had this patient received high dose insulin and perhaps ECMO 12 hours earlier, there would have been a different outcome. But the fact that she was never bradycardic confused the whole team. So this led us into thinking about what is the utility in pacing in tox brady overdoses. And the logic is, as was said very nicely, that this is different than a transcutaneous pacer in an obese patient. This is something that's surgically embedded in the myocardium and logically is going to con cause the ventricles to contract when it triggers. So we did a little dive into the literature on pacers in calcium channel blocker overdoses. There was a case report by Stover where a 74-year-old male overdosed on 1,500 milligrams of deltaism, had a low blood pressure, and it was bradycardic, ultimately went on a systole. They put a temporary transvenous pacer in, which actually worked, and the patient did well. There are other case series where patients got overdosed on case one was 80 tabs of verapamil, case two was 90 tabs of verapamil, and they were they put a hospital, they put a transvenous pacer in. If you actually look at the EKG strip on top of figure two, 
That's the EKG strip for patient one after a transvenous pacer was placed, and it looks like the ventricles are somewhat contracting on the EKG rhythm, but fluoroscopy actually showed the hearts were not beating despite some electrical activity on the electrocardiogram. This was another case series of multiple overdoses who ended up receiving cardiac pacing wires. Some of them did well, some of them did not. And in the end, there was another review by Ramosa in the Annals of Emergency Medicine, which took four patients who overdosed on diltiazem, and two of them made it, two of them didn't. Finally, there was a systematic review in Clintox, which pretty much showed that it's probably not going to be harmful to put a pacer in, but it also isn't consistently going to work. So our takeaways from this it can try, you can try and put in a pacemaker for calcium channel blocker overdoses, but it's important to remember that the modalities that are tried and tested, like high dose insulin, ECMO, glucagon, and calcium in the early stages, putting in a pacer shouldn't distract us ever from doing the modalities that we know really work. Furthermore, it's important to keep in mind that if you pace a patient, their heart rate isn't actually going to be bradycardic, but they could still be, their tissues might not necessarily be perfusing. With that in mind, I will ask, does anyone have any questions about this case? I'm sure they have many questions. Who was the the attending who worked with you? Uh, we had multiple Everybody. attendings on call. I actually, this was a, a couple of days. I don't remember who the first day attending was but it was a it was a very complicated patient because when we were first initially reported it was essentially this patient overdose on clonidine here are the vitals they did great for 10 hours and then 10 hours into the hospital of course they just deteriorated okay so we're going to end quickly but so who bob you want to make any last comments about this case um the one big comment that everybody forgets about pacemakers is that they typically induce uh, you know, um, ventricular asynchrony. So you lose your atrial kick, which is about, I don't know, 20% or 15% of cardiac output in a normal person. And then you desynchronize the ventricles, which make everything worse. You know, it's very common to see the heart rate increase and nothing happen to the blood pressure. And here, I think they got lulled into a sense of confidence by seeing a decent heart rate. Okay, we could do an awful lot more talking, but that was a great presentation. All the cases were great. So thanks, everybody. We'll see you next month. Thanks. Again.